I would like to introduce our first uh, speaker for the event, Marzi Fadoy, uh, who is a research lead at uh, Zera Alpha. She obtained her PhD um, at the UVA in language and, and machine translation. And uh, yeah, please, a warm welcome for uh, Marzi. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let's see if we all remember how it was done before having conferences on Zoom. Uh, I think we are up to a good start because everyone have their pants on, so <laughs> we can already <laughs> count on that. Uh, yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, Nora Retrieval at Zeta Alpha and uh, in general, semantic search and why it is important to pay attention to. So uh, what is semantic search? Uh, semantic search is a, a data searching technique that uh, focuses on uh, the underlying meaning of uh, words instead of, Oops, fell asleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Uh, that focuses on uh, trying to match underlying meanings of words instead of doing uh, keyword matching on surface level. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good. Uh, yeah, so uh, what, what does it mean? So it means that uh, instead of trying to do these uh, uh, very uh, surface level uh, keyword matching, we, uh, we do this on uh, a different abstract level. And it addresses two main issues of uh, regular or traditional search. And uh, that is the, the lexical gap challenge and uh, being able to address uh, complex and contextual queries. I'm going to talk about this a little more uh, later. Right, <clears throat> so why semantic search is important? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think we can, uh, I think we can uh, narrow it down to two main things. So one is that, uh, with semantic search, we are able to discover, we are able to broaden the, uh, uh, the pool of discovery. So if we, are, we go beyond keyword matching and actually uh, look at underlying meanings of words, then uh, the, the horizon of discovery is actually much uh, larger. And the second is that a lot of these discoveries are going to be more contextual. Uh, So uh, let's talk about dense retrieval. So dense retrieval is an instance of semantic search, one might say. And the idea here is that you, uh, you uh, match data points in your, sp uh, in your space to numerical vectors. So these data points can be text, like pieces of text, like documents or chunks or sentences, but it can also, uh, depends on what you, uh, what you are working on. And in the context of search, then there's also the data point of query. So the queries uh, should also be matched uh, to a single vector in this uh, embedding space. And what we do in dense retrieval is uh, we basically put all of these uh, data points in one space, and then we have the query that comes in from the user. We also put that in the space, and then we do a nearest neighbor search. So it sounds very simple, but it's also, there are a lot of challenges there. There's the scale challenge, the, the size of the documents uh, are large. Uh, yeah, so creating an index of this would be a challenge. So there are going to be a lot of talks today about different aspects of this. Next. Try it. Oh, not working. Uh, all right, great. So let's hope from now yeah, on. Yeah, should go up, so yeah, try again. Yeah. All right, great, thanks. Right, so getting back to it. So let's uh, talk about neural retrieval at the top. So we know this dense retrieval, like very in abstract level, what it means. So what we are doing with them at the top. So a, a very brief, bird's eye view of our retrieval system that uses dense models uh, at Zeta Alpha looks something like this. So we have this two stage, uh, yeah, a 
uh, we have this two stage uh, retrieval. So uh, the, the first one is actually the, the retrieval model. And the, the, then the second one is the re-ranking model. So uh, we first, uh, and for each of them, so both uh, stage one and stage two, uh, we use uh, multiple neural models. So we have experimented with uh, some of these and we are also experimenting with some more right now. And the idea is that at retrieval, we, uh, we retrieve the top K results and then uh, the re-ranker re-ranks the top K results uh, into a better, hopefully better order. Right, so uh, what we have done at Zeta Alpha is, uh, so one of the challenges is that we don't really have label data. So if you have worked with our uh, uh, platform, you see that uh, it's like a very particular domain and we had to create uh, our own evaluation set in order to be able to tell how we are doing basically. And uh, we did that basically. So we created this set of uh, four uh, categories of queries that include short queries, uh, knowledge gap questions, quarter questions, and paper titles. And did some evaluation. So our current system, which is actually based on one of the models uh, that Niels uh, released and uh, he's going to talk about later, uh, works better right now uh, than our keyword retrieval system. Right, so remember uh, the voice that I talked about. So why we are using dense retrieval. So one was to address the lexical gap that we have. And the other was to be able to handle uh, complicated queries and complicated context. So let's see how it looks like at Zeta Alpha. So here you have a query. So the query is one term generalization. And then you have two sets of uh, documents. So these are the titles of papers that were retrieved by uh, keyword search and dense retrieval search. So you see that uh, on the keyword side, uh, the almost all of the titles have some form of the word generalization. There are also some, uh, let's say wrong uh, matchings that happen there. So uh, there's a word generative that was matched to generalization. But what happens on the dense retrieval side is, so there are some examples of generalization there, but there's also cases that the, the title has uh, words like memorization and regularization. And if you know the concept of generalization, you know that it's very much related to these two other concepts. But the user intent uh, when they put this query is not uh, entirely clear. So the dense retrieval model takes care of covering context that the user didn't put. All right, let's look at a second example. So again, we have the the query, the list of keyword retrieval and dense retrieval results. So the query in this case is a question from our uh, Quora data set. So it's like a real Quora question that someone asked, why are CNNs better at classifications than RNNs? So we see on the keyword retrieval side that the, uh, some of the terms in the, uh, in the query was matched to some of the titles. So there's like classification in some titles, convolutional neural network in some, but not all of them, but, uh, and also not uh, together as what it really means. But what happens on the retrieval, is, uh, dense retrieval is something different. So I want to give you a moment to actually read the highlighted titles. Yeah, I think this is like a really good example that uh, the model captures the user intent that the idea uh, behind the query was that there are these two models, the RNN models and the CNN models. And we want to see, uh, we are looking for a comparative study of these in the field of, uh, in the task of text classification. And uh, I, I really like these, uh, this particular example because just by looking at the titles, you can see some answers to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so for instance, like the second paper, uh, 
It says that CNNs found to jump around more skillfully than RNNs, so that can be one reason of why using CNNs for text classification. Right, so uh, now I told you about uh, the, the work in production that we have at Zeta Alpha in our platform and uh, what it looks like and why we are doing that. And uh, now I want to get into the, uh, the ongoing research that we've been doing. So there are a couple of challenges that we, uh, we are working on and uh, that exist in this area of work. Uh, so very briefly, I can summarize them in these three points. Training models uh, with no or very limited data sets. So working in a particular domain like our uh, platform, which is the domain of AI machine learning and the task that we want to do on them, there are very limited data sets available out there. So training models on that would be difficult. We are also very con uh, concerned with having fast online models. So we have our users, all of you guys, that you don't want to wait for results, so it has to be fast, and uh, you basically don't want to spend a lot of time at inference with what you do. And then an ongoing research is basically improving the search quality. Uh, right, so let's talk about the first part, uh, the first challenge. So the first challenge is we have limited amount of data. So how we have been uh, working with that and trying to address this is in different ways. So one of the ways is uh, using self-supervised tasks. So the idea is that we have this large amount of unannotated data and we can use, uh, come up with self-supervised tasks that can automatically extract and create uh, the training data that we need to train our models. So one example, like a very simple example of that would be that we have uh, archive papers and then uh, we can use the title of them as query and the paper itself as the document that we want to retrieve. So you don't need human annotations for that uh, and that's good. Uh, the second approach is data augmentation. So the idea here is that, uh, so in anything that we do, we can increase uh, the size of the data, but also the, uh, let's say the uh, diversity of the data by doing augmentation. So uh, one particular example of that, that we have been working on is using the doc to query approach, which takes a document. It's also based on a paper by Rodrigo, who is, go uh, who is going to talk uh, later today. Uh, yeah, so the idea is to take a document and from that document generate one or multiple queries that uh, can uh, be potential queries to be used to retrieve that document. And then use the, those queries to expand the document. So uh, you basically uh, expand the text of the document. And this has been shown to improve uh, the, the learning process in a uh, retrieval system. And the, then the third, uh, and. Uh, something that's probably uh, very well known and well used is in general using pre-trained models. So these general purpose pre-trained models that are available are very useful and starting from them instead of basically starting from scratch to train your own model, uh, that's a good idea. Right, so uh, what uh, we have been doing in our research is uh, so we have our internal evaluations at Zeta Alpha, but we also want to basically know what we are doing with uh, the uh, established and existing data sets in order to also put us uh, with previous works in the literature and see where we can benefit from them. And uh, in order to do that, so we did an evaluation on the TREK uh, DL 2020 task, which is based on MS Marco with a lot more annotations. And uh, these are uh, some results for our current in production system using Duck to Query to, uh, to expand uh, our documents and also our uh, just say regular BM25 search, just to give you some idea of where these dense retrieval models are, or at least our dense retrieval. Right. And uh, another thing that I mentioned was improving the the quality of search. So that's something that is ongoing. 
what we have been working on is to, uh, at this uh, stage, to improve uh, the, the re-ranker stage. So the idea is that, if you remember, we have these two stage uh, models. So first retrieval, then re-ranker. And uh, by the re-ranker uh, improvement, by uh, improvement of the re-ranker, what I mean is that uh, the trying to uh, fine tune the re-ranker that we have, which uh, we started with a T5 uh, uh, mono re-ranker. Now we are using a mini LM one uh, to, uh, to the data that we have in particular. And uh, the idea is that to use a cross encoder that looks something like this. And what it, this cross encoder does is given a query on a document, it basically decides whether they are relevant or not. So in order to train this, we need triplets of query, relevant document, irrelevant document. And where this comes from is the question that we have been working on. So we have the query relevant documents from existing data sets. So the MS Marco, for instance, data, data set. And then the irrelevant ones are the ones that we thought would be interesting to see how much they can contribute. Yeah, so uh, the irrelevant or negative samples, the idea is to, so you can think of it as what we are providing a model to help it learn to distinguish between correct and wrong answers, right? So we uh, did a couple of experiments. Uh, the, uh, so as the baseline, we use the original uh, ranking of MS Marco that is based on Bing as the negative samples, but we also looked at the BM25 ranking, the dense retrieval uh, output that we had as negative samples. And then we also did a couple of experiments with uh, one with a similarity-based hard negative and another with a pooled negatives. So the idea here was that uh, the hard negative one, the idea was that to, if uh, basically to try to see uh, the, list of returning documents as a ranked list in order of similarity to the positive label that we have, right? So what this would do then is that if a, a document that is unlabeled is very similar to a document that was labeled positive, then uh, this is probably a false negative. So this is probably a positive that the annotators didn't see. But if it shows up high and it's not contextually similar to the positive example, then it's probably a good example of a hard negative that the model uh, should be able to distinguish between the correct one. Right, so uh, we did a couple of experiments and we came to some conclusions. So one is that the, the diversity in negatives seems to be more important than having hard to learn samples. So very interestingly, we saw that the hard using only hard negatives for training the cross encoder for the re-ranker didn't really help. It basically really hurt. So uh, yeah, but like using just like a BM25 uh, output, which is the, uh, if you can look at it as like a list of less relevant results, it actually helps more the re-ranker. And we have some hypothesis for this, but it's not entirely clear to us why this happened. The second thing that we saw was that the, so there should be a consistency between training and inference time. And here, what I mean is that like the first stage, the search and retrieval stage and the re-ranker uh, list that we are using for training. But it seems that it's only, uh, hurting some approaches more than the others. So if uh, the model is like, uh, uh, is uh, if the re-ranker that we are trying to uh, train is based on the dense retrieval models, then it's very uh, uh, dependent to be consistent with uh, the first stage as a dense retrieval model as well. And then the last one, which I think is interesting is that uh, the, 
uh, our best result that we got was with our pooled negative uh, approach. So what we did in that experiment was to basically pull the top K results from the dense retrieval model, everything together, and then sample the negatives for uh, each query from this pool. So it has the diversity of results because for each query, we don't only look at the top K results from that query, but it also has the uh, hardness aspect to it because these are like everything in the pool are the documents that the model tends to retrieve and bring up. And this was uh, one of our first models that actually got better performance than the original rank. Right, so uh, I talked about how it works in retrieval, right? And uh, here's like another example in our system. I really recommend uh, for you guys uh, when you are on our, on our platform to try out the vector search with uh, long and more complex queries and see how it works. But uh, the question is, where else can we use these uh, semantic representations? So, so far we talked about only using them in retrieval, but there are different parts in our system that we can use that. So the visualization of papers in, uh, is one aspect of it. Uh, the recommendation system is one. Question answering uh, and also author search and the author graph. Uh, so these are all uh, potential research areas that we want to uh, take our uh, semantic uh, representation and semantic models that we have learned into. That's it for me. Thank you. Any questions? Do you have any questions? All right. I'm going to go to the back. Let's see if the cable is. I measured this before, so it should be OK. Uh, or is it there? <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a question To I see a lot of metrics. Uh, to what extent do they correspond to the human evaluation of the perception of quality? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, if I go back, maybe I also didn't really mention. So the metrics that I have, uh, maybe very briefly, they're all of them higher is better. So the first two, uh, mean average precision and NDCG are a, a evaluation metric for uh, the quality of ranking. And the second two tells us uh, what the top K basically looks like, like the recall in top K and also how many annotations we have there. And uh, so the question of how much these correlate with human annotations, uh, there, I, I think there, were, uh, there was a paper last week or two weeks ago that actually looked at the uh, MS Marco data set, which is a data set that we are also working on and uh, how much it, uh, the, uh, the positive labels that are there uh, correlates with human annotations if they look at it again. And I think they saw at a high number, like 60% or something, uh, if a new annotator is given a top one or top K results from a good model and the actual positive label that is in the data set, they prefer the first one. So uh, yeah, uh, it's the, uh, the, the reality of having these data sets. So they are like very useful. They have helped to advance this area, but uh, that is also true that at some point you probably have to stop fine tuning on that. And uh, that's also true about a lot of benchmarks. I think Niels is going to talk about it a little today that how, uh, where these benchmarks are lacking and uh, like they are good to a certain point to get the models there, but uh, yeah, you don't also have to obsess over them because they are not perfect. So they are like one example of uh, uh, defining a particular task in, in, a, in an area.